Welcome. Uh, welcome to the controller session with BBC Falls, uh, Cassine Harrison. Uh, we've got a lot to get through today. And what we'd also love for you guys to do, have you all downloaded the app? Let me just make sure. Have you all got the app? You can answer me back. I won't bite your head off. Uh, have you all downloaded it? You've all got it? Yes, that's what I want to hear. Well, what we'd love you to do is during the course of the session, if you can post some questions to Cassian, that would be fantastic. And then during the course of the session, I'll direct the questions to you and, and he will answer them as honestly as he can. Well, Cassian has only been in uh, this job uh, since October last year. Uh, reporting to Kim Schilling, Hall, uh, Schilling, Schilling Law, of course, who is controller of BBC Two and BBC Four. Uh, you inherited the channel in good shape, didn't you? But the decision as we know, to retain BBC Four and to redirect BBC Three to online did cause a few ructions and it was criticised as, you know, as being elitism almost. And of course, your budgets were cut by about 26%, I believe. Um, so what can you do with the channel? Can you make it an even better channel than it was? What are your plans? And can he prove his detractors wrong? Well, that's exactly what we're going to find out today. Now, I know this is your first time because you've not Feature been in. Or, yeah, I was going to say, you're feeling nervous, you're you feeling please. comfortable? Yeah. I hope you're feeling comfortable. I and am. I want you to enjoy this as much as the guys there will be enjoying it as well. But um, have you been enjoying the job over the last few months? Yeah, absolutely. It's phenomenal. Um, uh, I got various texts and all the rest of it when I got the job, which is congratulations on getting the best job in television. And I kind of personally feel that it is the best job in television. It's a, it's an amazing privilege. It's a, it's a a really unique, really singular channel. Uh, there's nothing else like it in the UK broadcasting landscape. It's doing incredibly well, as you say. Uh, it's building a fabulous le legacy, you know, from Janice through Richard. Uh, it's managed to build a really unique voice and way of approaching things, yeah. and the audience really respond to it. It's a fabulous platform for innovation. You know, that's very much what Danny and Tony have said they want me to do with it, which is to do and explore new and fresh things. Um, and also, it's terrific now that Kim's in the job uh, to be able to really work, because Kim and I go back a long time, we've worked together for four or five years in commissioning as well, to be able to get two channels to work together in a really coordinated way so that there's a real narrative between the two and the two channels can really support each yeah. other. But it's interesting that you talk about you know, them wanting you to create new things. Mm. Is that possible when you've had a 26% cut in budget? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that, um, you know, everyone would always like more money. I mean, personally, I'd like more money. I'm sure you'd like more money. Any business would like more money. Um, sometimes, strangely, actually having more money isn't necessarily a solution. I and mean, I think that the way that I respond to a budget cut, if that's what it is, is actually to think, well, okay, what can we do? How can we work around that? And when I talk about innovation, one of the ways that I think is quite interesting is innovation in finance. How are there different ways that we can pull together projects that we can make television happen? Yeah. Um, and, you know, and I've been able to build up one of the things that I've been doing over the last six months is to be able to build up really strong relationships all the way across the BBC with nations with Wales, with Scotland, with Northern Ireland, build up relationships with other organisations, yeah. British Library, British Museum. And if you think laterally and you think cleverly, I think actually you can actually come up with really elegant and interesting solutions. But what is the distinct difference between BBC Two and BBC Four? I know I heard Danny talking about it a little mm. bit earlier with Dermot. What is BBC Four's role within I the I think BBC? it's very clear. I mean, BBC Two is a mainstream channel. Uh, what it's there to do is to draw audiences in and draw mainstream audiences in. What BBC Four is there to do is to dive into subjects with real depth. Uh, and the simplest way that I look at it is that BBC Four brings depth to BBC Two and BBC Two brings scale to BBC Four. The two have a very sympathetic relationship between the two. And, you know, and we've done that really well and proved it. We had a fabulous season, which is the 18th century season, just last spring. Uh, where what we had was a really big, really broad, really stimulating, really enjoyable film which launched it on Handel's Messiah on BBC Two. And then we had a whole sequence of programming on BBC Four, which was uh, Lucy Worsley on The Georgians, yeah. Susie Klein doing a series on music of the 18th century. So, so essentially it's about you, you, go, you go deeper, you into, go deeper. into the yeah. issue than perhaps would happen on, on, on BBC Two. Yeah. But then um, we've actually had a few questions that came in earlier mm. from the app. I'm going to throw one to you now. Um, Let's talk about the BBC Four, BBC Three issue. Mm. Um, how can BBC Four justify its existence when BBC Three is, is being forced online? 
Um, I think that in the end, and I think Danny was very clear about it when, it when it happened, was that a decision had to be made. We've got a frozen license fee, and we've had that for five years, basically, you know, and costs are arising. Cuts, we had to do something, and we had to do something of scale. In the end, Danny's position was, was that, well, if I'm going to maintain both services as well as I can, then the one that is the most logical to go online, because in the end, we're all moving towards a more IP, internet-driven landscape. Yeah. The one that's more logical to do something radical with is going to be BBC Three, but Danny was very clear about that. He'd rather not have done yeah. it. He'd rather have waited two or three years. So was there a moment um, when that whole thing was happening where mm. you thought, oh my goodness, am I gonna be called into Danny's office and he's gonna tell me that my channel's going online? What on earth will I do then? Was there a moment where you were a little bit worried that that may well happen? Yeah, I think so. I think that um, uh, I think that we all have to be realistic, you know, and we have to be realistic about what the BBC can do with the funding that is available to it. Uh, and I think, you know, one of the great challenges that the BBC has is that people endlessly want it to do everything. Um, and we, in the end, we can't do everything, and we do have to focus more tightly on what are the core services that we want but to do, deliver. But do you think that some, that some license fee payers feel like you should be doing everything, that you should serve all audiences, though? Well, yes, but you know, we have a finite budget. So we can't, you know, th th there's only so much that we can do. In, in, in we do want to serve all audiences as effectively as we can. But as I say, with a frozen license fee yeah. against the background of inflation, in the end, the amount of money that we have to spend on programming and content was falling. Well, a lot of producers here will want to know, who is your audience? Who's who my are you audience? broadcasting to? Uh, I am broadcasting to, I mean, there's a fairly straightforward demographic, which is it's an older, it tends to be an older ABC One audience, mm -hmm. um, but define, actually... Define older for me. Uh, 55 plus, uh -huh. but actually, you know, that would seem like, you know, I can imagine that what your probably your next point will be, oh gosh, well, I'll, isn't the BBC super serving a particular Ooh, audience? You must never preempt my question. No, I don't know. But the, the point is that, that I, I would say, in fact, is what's really interesting, and when I looked at the demographics of the channel when I was applying for the job, is that actually, when any of our programs, and quite a lot of our programs and our originations, get numbers over, above, over and above 450,000, 500,000, it's amazing how we actually get a much broader spread of audience in yeah. there. We get a lot more C2DEs and we get a lot more young people as well. So actually, the more successful the program, our programs are, yeah. the bigger audience we talk to. Well, let's take a look at one of your most successful programs, mm -hmm. and that, of course, is The First Georgians. Let's take a look at it. Oh, that's of course, as the lovely Lucy Worsley there presenting. Indeed. You actually um, chose that as a clip that defines your channel. Mm. Why? Um, because uh, we are a channel which is factual, which is about art and culture and history. But what's very distinct about what BBC4 is, is its tone. Uh, and it would be very easy for BBC4 to be a dry and dusty channel. Uh, and what Lucy brings, and what I think we want to bring across all of our programmes, is a real set of programmes, is a real sense of joy and pleasure yeah. in the subject. You know, I mean, I think that Lucy is clearly an incredibly singular talent. What's terrific about her is she's not just a presenter. She's somebody who's absolutely engaged with what her subject is and knows it absolutely backwards. But also, she approaches it in a manner which is it's fun and it's enjoyable. And I think, you know, in a, in a channel which is fundamentally about factual content predominantly, what I really want be BBC4 to do is to be a, a channel where I suppose it's a sense there's a lot of people out there who had a rather rough time at school and kind of feel a bit frightened of history and intellectual things and what I want BBC4 to be is a channel where people think that they can rock up and they can enjoy yeah. themselves and they don't feel threatened and they don't feel small and they don't feel like they're not smart enough to enjoy yeah. this kind of content. I feel like you were talking from experience when you were talking about being frightened <laughs> in history lessons, Cathy. <laughs> um, now you've also described the channel as being um, an amazing journey through a secret garden. Yes. Um, do you want to elaborate on that sort of hippie way of describing BBC okay, Four? Uh, yeah. Uh, I, I, well, I think I think the, the critical thing in that metaphor is actually the thing about the door, uh, and the door to the secret garden is that it's very easy again with the kind of content that, that BBC Four has to end up with kind of approaching subjects in a really very broad and I would say quite diffuse kind of way. Yeah. Uh, so you know you can end up with what my, my, my kind of jokey title of the kind of 
series that you don't want this kind of history of the Wellington boot, which just feels like it's a kind of vast, amorphous, let's wander through 300 years of social history. Um, but what I think really uh, is really singular or really particular about what BBC Four's tone is and the way that we approach subjects is that actually what we want to do is it, or the, what works very effectively is to take a very particular subject, yeah. to take something very singular, be it mushrooms, oddly, or be it the Fabergé egg. But those, those, those top lines, which are great, which cut, re cut, well, cut through very well on the EPG, behind them is an incredibly fascinating story. So mm -hmm. by the secret garden, I mean that what we do is we offer something up on the EPG that you go, I recognize that, but I know I don't know about it. And then when you come to the programme, you discover yeah. behind it a wealth of really fascinating stuff. Well, when we talk about fascinating stories, you've done mm. really well with things like uh, uh, biopic dramas like um, Hattie or Burton mm -hmm. and Taylor um, and documentaries like the Queen documentary, the story of musicals, Goodbye yeah. Television Centres, all things um, that people would have learned something from if we're using that secret uh, garden analogy. But what with there being no drama budget, yeah anymore mm. how do you um, continue to keep that mainstream appeal because th that's very mainstream things that we're talking about here no. you know obviously Burton and Taylor and, and sure. Television Centre. Well I mean I think that what we do have and which remains an incredibly important incredibly vigorous uh, uh, part of the schedule is of course our Saturday night foreign dramas and we continue to do that and we continue to invest really heavily in that and they continue to do really well with the audience so you know we can we've got the bridge coming back we've got something we'll look at later we've got a wonderful Belgian kind of conspiracy thriller. So that element of drama, mm. uh, Inspector Montalbano is on at the moment, really does bring a big mainstream audience. Yeah. I think that um, in the context of mainstream, in other contexts, we don't need drama to do that. You know, that Lucy Worsley series got close on a million. We had a Ray Mir series on yeah. the Wild West, but which got close on a million. But if you don't get um, close to a million or above, do mm. those shows still matter? Because, uh, you know, you, you, the, the budget's been cut. You need to justify, really, the reason mm -hmm. why, yeah. why you're there. And if you're having these sort of dramas, these sort of shows that aren't getting the, the, the well, viewers remember, you Well, remember, those, those dramas that, that, that BBC4 had, and they were a really fast, a really brilliant kind of singular part of the BBC4 offer, there was only ever a maximum of them of two a year. You know, that, that, that not having them does not make a radical difference to what the offer of the channel is. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think the other thing which is important in what you say is that BBC4, thankfully, one of the real privileges of running the channel is it's not a channel which Danny or the rest of the BBC or Tony think is a channel driven by ratings. It's not so you fundamentally can take chances, there. Then. Absolutely. So one of the things in the context of drama that I'm doing is okay, so we can't afford to do a Hattie or an Enid or something like that. But I've got a brilliant thing that Ben and I and the drama department have worked up called Dialogues, which is where what we're going to do is a whole series of 15 minute dramas with writers who are completely new to television and kind of really just taking on that the, the, the legacy of the Alan Bennett talking heads thinking about what we can do which is smaller in scale but is still really bold and innovative and I think that's really exciting I think that's the kind of thing that BBC4 should be doing yeah I mean uh, one of the questions I think which um, lots of people are going to be asked over the next few days regarding um, diversity is interesting when it comes to BBC4 because mm -hmm. a lot of your experts obviously come from the academia sure. uh, 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 side of things mm -hmm. and they're not that great when it comes to diversity even within those uh, those sorts of industries mm -hmm. so how do you get over that obviously you've got Lucy so you know you do have female presenters but when Absolutely. it comes to ethnic minorities for example how do you deal with that situation I think uh, d as, as, as all of my uh, fellow commissioners and channel controllers, all of us know that what we have to do is we have to work harder and we have to hunt harder. You know, I've got a new presenter, a fabulous academic from the British Museum called Sona Data, uh, who is doing her first series for us, an amazing three-part series on the treasures of India. She's a historian of, of, of Indian culture and archaeology. Um, you know, she's a new presenter for the BBC. I think she'll do incredibly well on BBC4. I know that we all, Kim and I, think, well, if she does incredibly well on BBC4, maybe she'll do incredibly well on BBC2 as well. And that's what I think think that BBC4 can be and one of the things it should be is there's a place where we can bring on and we can try out new talents uh, and as I say with the Dialogues uh, project that's something where we're bringing people who've never worked for the BBC before and we're giving them an opportunity there's another thing which I think we may take a look at which um, I'm, I'm really proud of which is ne middle of September we've got a, a big moment which is what I'm calling BBC4 goes abstract we're going to celebrate yeah. abstract art uh, and one of the things that I've done for that, which, uh, uh, you know, raised some eyebrows when I suggested we did it, is I've commissioned four artists to remake the BBC Don't Four talk channel too much events. About it, we're talk oh, okay, about we're going to talk it about it later. But, you know, but again, we, you know, we're letting, I'm, I'm letting artists have unmediated yeah. access to the BBC. 
okay, well, that brings me to my next question. I would, you know, if we're going to talk about abstract art, but we're going to obviously talk more about that later. But the sorts of things that you list are quite niche, I would say. Um, so when you're looking about, when you're looking to uh, attract younger audiences, they may not automatically gravitate towards your channel, mm -hmm. but you do do things that they would be interested in. Yeah. So how do you draw them in? What are you doing to try and get younger people to say, do you know what, BBC4 is going to be one of those channels that I will flick through and check what's on it, in mm -hmm. the same way that I will do with E4, same way that I will do with BBC3. Uh, well, one of the ways that we do it is, uh, for, for me, is to work out and to do collaborations with the rest of the BBC. So I don't mean to go back to the abstract season, but it's a really good example, which is that not only are we doing a chunk of stuff on BBC4, but actually what's happening is we're doing a huge event with Tate Liverpool, where we're going to get the people of Liverpool to uh, create their own living Mondrian. Yeah. Uh, and that's actually, it's not even going on BBC4, that's going on the one show. Uh, and that is, you know, absolutely taking a concept which is driven originally mm -hmm. by BBC4, mm -hmm. but spreading it out across the BBC. Yeah. Uh, so that the kinds of things we do are accessible to other audiences and also hopefully they'll be attracted to BBC4 to come and see what we're doing. But what's quite difficult, I guess, is, is you having to shout from the rooftops about exactly what it is that you do mm. and that you have programmes which younger people, you know, even with the schedule you have now, mm -hmm. that younger people may be interested in watching, but they just don't know about you. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you have... You don't even have your own Twitter handle, which in this day and age is probably the cheapest way of getting your story mm -hmm. out, and seems quite lazy if you don't have one. So uh, well, do, do, do you think I'm, the I'm in discussion about exactly that that issue, and, and there will but, be one but very soon. It's not even something you have to be in discussion. I could sit here right now with my iPad and I can set you up a Twitter handle. <laughs> you know, I've got my own Twitter not, handle. You're you know, welcome know, to no, follow no, me. I know you do, but I mean, yeah. you know, in terms uh -huh. of a channel having yeah. one, mm -hmm. and I think that. You know, perhaps, is, is it a case of... Actually, the thing that's more embarrassing is we don't even have a Facebook page. Oh, in this day, I mean, I've heard that you <laughs> yeah, said that. I, I, I mean, absolutely, I'm with you on that. that. Yeah. Um, but do you <laughs> think, you know, in this day and age, that shouldn't be like, it shouldn't be like that at all. Well, I mean... You can't say that you want younger people to to engage with you mm -hmm. and to watch what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And actually, two simplest and cheapest way of doing it, despite mm -hmm. a 26% cut in budget, mm -hmm. um, it's the easiest thing for you to do. I think you're absolutely right. And you've been in the job since October, and it's still not there. Well... <laughs> You might need to talk to the marketing department about it, but you know, the BBC can be the way the BBC works, but we're on it. Okay. Yeah. So I'm hoping to see that by nine o'clock tomorrow morning. You can. I mean, bear in mind, well, you probably, <laughs> yeah, that's quite good, actually. Now I can phone them up and say we need to do it by nine o'clock tomorrow morning. Um, all right. Now, Cassian, as yeah. we've mentioned before, you've not been the job very long, and the producers here in the room who would love to work with you, obviously, but they yeah. don't really know you because you've not been around yes. um, for that long. So I'm going to ask a few personal questions. Right. Um, it's a bit of a get to know you bit. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, we did ask Danny earlier on, so I'm going to ask you the same question. What's fictional TV character would you be and why? Right, so I had to think about this one and I thought that the fictional character that I would like to be, mm -hmm. and I did ask some people about this, would be kind of Bob Peck in Edge of Darkness, you know, deep, tortured, uh, searching out the truth and trying to uncover it. I did ask some people what fictional character they thought I was yeah. and they said that they thought I was a fraggle. <laughs> so there's a bit of a conflict. I'm going to have to work to see how I can integrate oh, the two together. Goodness. Doesn't that constitute bullying in the BBC? Never well. um, so what would you say in that case would be your guilty pleasure viewing? What's your what, what do you watch marathons of when I'm you're at home? I'm a tart, really. I mean, for all of running BBC Four, frankly, Game of Thrones. Boobs and Dragons, oh, you can't really? go wrong. Oh, no. I know, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, th I mean, genuinely, it is, it's quite sad. Quote, boobs and Dragons. <laughs> don't, don't tell. Yeah. Yeah, oh, God, I'll never get to work with HBO. Um, um, uh, uh, unhappily, my children, I just end up watching Endless Simpsons with the children. Uh, yeah. And um, uh, I think pretty much what everybody else ends up watching, really. I mean, I think that's the thing, is that my tastes are, although, you know, and I think this is an important thing, is BBC4 can be perceived from, from the outside as being fantastically cerebral and all the rest of it. It isn't. It's just got a very particular way of looking at the world. And me running it is that my tastes are as broad as anyone else's, yeah. you know. Um, uh, there are particular elements that I really love about BBC4, about its concentration on detail and, going, and, and on going in more, de in, in more depth. But fundamentally, it's television. It should be enjoyable. Now, hypothetically, yes. if you were a TV presenter instead of a TV exec, yes. um, what show would you have loved to have presented or still oh. want to present? Mm. I'm always slightly jealous of Monty Don. Really? I think okay, it'd be quite nice to do gardening shows, I wouldn't it? You know, I think that would be quite actually. fun. Exactly, you know, just Gar potter gardening around. Gardening with Cassian. Gardening with yeah, Cassian. Lovely. Yeah, lovely. Um, and if you hadn't worked in telly when you were a little boy and um, you were thinking about what you wanted to do with your career, if it hadn't yes. been telly, what did you most want to become? Oh, 
well, quite a few things, really. Um, I did spend most of my childhood, I was quite naughty when I was a child. Really? Uh, yeah, afraid to say, I was quite a pyromaniac. Uh, uh, yeah, okay. uh, well, it's worth people know if you want to get to know me. I quite liked, you know, yes, blowing things up as much as anything else. Uh, and I did have various fantasies of, you know, continuing to blow things up. So it was either going to be a jet fighter pilot or I just wanted to be a chemist that made bombs. Oh. Like, no, it's a very nice antisocial I'm, I'm glad you impulse. Went in that way. So I guess you're going to talk about illegal ways no, of no, blowing no. things up. Well, okay. yep. um, so if you weren't sitting on the stage hanging out with me and these guys, yeah. um, what would you be doing? What do you like doing for fun? You've mentioned gardening, mm -hmm. um, but what else do you do for fun? Uh, I'm a terrible geek. I quite like, so um, the, the, one of the odd things I like, I, television is fantastic, but I, another thing which I've always really enjoyed is. Um, is kind of electronics and computers and all the rest of it. So actually, one of the things that uh, I, I end up doing with my kids is um, when you were talking about apps. Yeah. Uh, so there is a kind of Harrison family app store. And so I sit with my kids and we make apps for iPhones. So my oh, daughter really? has a fabulous one, which is basically has various cats on it. And if you stroke them, they purr. Oh, <laughs> oh <laughs> so I guess. Yeah, no, so, so that's kind of, I quite like that kind of thing. Okay. So, mm. so you'd quite be, could you be keen on, say, technology type shows on BBC Four? Well, I think we do. We do technology. Uh, I think that, um, you know, we've actually got a brilliant one on at the moment. It's called Everyday Miracles, which is a fantastic presenter called Mark Miodovnik, which is about the extraordinary develops in materials that, that, that give us the world we live in, which is, it, again, it's a really classic kind of BBC Four approach to something, which is actually, it's, you know, the extraordinary story of a foam cushion which, you know, is a kind of ubiquitous thing that everybody here is sitting on, but actually the story of how it was created and how it was invented is absolutely fascinating. Yeah. Absolutely the kind of thing that BBC Four loves doing. You think you know it, but actually let's take you yeah. underneath it and show you the really interesting story behind it. We're talking about um, uh, apps and what have you. You may as well yeah. take a question yeah. from the apps. Loads of them are coming in, thank you so much. Um, uh, let's do this one. What is the future of science on BBC Four? Oh, on BBC, not just in general. Yeah, uh, 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 it's an absolutely integral part of what BBC Four is. I mean, I started off, you know, I worked in commissioning doing science and natural history and history, uh, and BBC Four science was always a passion of mine. It's fabulous to to, to be running the channel and continuing to do it. Science. Um, what we, what, we, what we do with science on BBC4, I think it's really singular, and I don't think that anyone else does it, and no one else does it in the world, which is, and it, and it works really well with the kind of overall BBC's kind of portfolio of how we do science on BBC1 and how we do it on BBC2. BBC4, we can be unashamedly, brain-fryingly, yeah. intellectual. I mean, you know, it's really, I, there was a moment of frisson of joy for me when I was able to commission a show for the second episode of which was all about information theory. Information theory breaks even my brain ache, but it's basically the idea that there is no reality. In fact, we are but three-dimensional projections of a two-dimensional information matrix on the surface of the universe. Well remembered. Well, that well amazing. you know, um, but we do that, and Jim Al-Khalili is rather fabulous at doing those, and they rate really well. People I mean, love them. Well, one of the highest rated shows on the, the channel was about it's, toilets. It was indeed. Yes. And well, there you go. There's another singular thing with a deep history behind it. I don't know how deep we want to go. But and yeah. if someone just come into your office and go, do you know what? I want to do a history of toilets, history of loo. Well, it was commissioned before I was doing it. But if someone had come to me and said, I would have said, certainly that's a very interesting thing to do. But again, really singular thing. You think you know it, but you don't. Yeah. OK, we're going to move on to um, uh, arts because we're going to talk about the mm. genres now. So according to which, which sort of genres you guys are, are most interested in, we're going to start with um, arts. Yeah. Um, so we had a question which was posted on the app earlier on um, about Tony Hall's art push. Yeah. Um, and how will this all play out on BBC Four? Do you sort of feel like Tony Hall's there with an all-seeing eye and going, yes, Cassian, this is what I want you to do. Yes, Cassian, because no. arts is his thing. Arts is his thing, but he's the director general, and for good or for ill, the poor chap's too busy to be able to be looking over my shoulder all the time. No, I think that, that, that what was fabulous with Tony's you know, conviction and, and, and the desire to make a big announcement about the BBC's commitment to the arts is I think it was a really important message that needed to be put out there. I mean, BBC Four is predominantly or significantly an arts channel. It's about arts, culture, and the history of ideas. 
Um, and to have that support and that vindication from the Director General is a terrific thing to have. But in terms of how we do it, uh, certainly he's not phoning me up and saying you have to do it this way, you have to do it that way. What he wants, which I want as well, is for us to find really good, really innovative ways to engage with the history of art and the history of culture, but also to engage with the fabulous creativity and the creative community that's out there now yeah. around the UK. But, but when you do things that to do with theatre or dance or, yeah. or music, mm. it just doesn't... It doesn't seem to translate that well to TV, does it? Because you, you don't seem to get the numbers necessarily that you would like for those sorts of programmes. Mm -hmm. Like what? Um, well, you know, when you're talking about things like Glyndebourne, yeah. for, for, for instance, mm -hmm. and, you know, um, so you have those sort of um, uh, live performance shows that, that you'd have you know, elsewhere. Mm -hmm. They're shown on the big screen and cinemas and yeah. what have you. Sure. How do you encourage people to actually watch that if they wouldn't naturally well, I mean, I think go and watch it anyway. What, what, what we have to do, you, you, with, with, with the mix of what we have on BBC4, inevitably some of it is going to be the history of toilets, which is going to be really populist, but we're also there to talk to and to address uh, you know, more narrow interests. Uh, you know, I'm not expecting that we're going to get a million people to come to an opera capture. I'm not expecting a million people to come to the proms. But I think that the BBC's coverage of the proms is absolutely fundamental to what the BBC should be doing. You know, that, that the sponsorship of a major season of orchestral classical music every year, um, you know, is an absolutely integral part of what the BBC's DNA yeah. is. Um, and, you know, it needs to go on television. I think we all feel that. BBC Four is a terrific place to put, place to put it. And it's interesting, obviously, you were talking earlier about, you know, wanting to make sure that BBC Four doesn't become dusty and old, yeah. for example. And with the high level of, I mean, I'm a classical music fan, but mm -hmm. with the high level of classical music that you do have on the network, mm -hmm. some could argue that you are still being quite dust, you know, because you are broadcasting to a certain sector of, of society. I don't, think, I don't think, I think we have a good balance of what we have with classical music, but I don't think it's dominant, uh, you know. In terms of our music coverage, what's what the predominant part of what BBC Four's music coverage is about popular music, and it's that you know, like Saturday night dramas, another thing which you know my predecessors have built up through much love and ingenuity is our Friday night music nights, yeah. uh, you know, and that's a fabulous thing to be the curator of. You know, there's an absolutely dedicated audience out there that come to those programmes. Again, nobody else in the broadcasting landscape is doing anything like it, um, and you know, to be able to bring you know to to to, to bring hard, not hard, but really, um, you know, adept and deep journalism to the subject of popular music and to really get into its depths, I think is just a really fabulous thing to be able to do. But then you've also, talking about those Friday nights, you previously mm. said before that it's too full of white male rockers from the west coast of America. I agree. Um, so what do you feel is missing then? What do you want people to, to bring to you so it becomes less of that and more of something well, else? Well, I think less of white male middle class rockers from the west coast of America. Uh, you know, there are a couple of ways that we do that. I think there, there are two, two elements. There's kind of content and form. Uh, I think form is quite interesting because I think that the challenge for Friday nights on BBC Four has that there's been a kind of preponderance of archive-driven, commentary-driven journeys into elements and areas of the history of popular music, which I think has been terrific, and those pieces are absolutely seminal. They're almost kind of series of record as much as anything else. I think that, you know, we need to turn the dial a bit on that. You know, one of the things that I'm exploring is collaborating with Six Music, which is a really good thing. Again, we're kind of looking around the BBC for other partners, uh, where we're going to do big live nights which are kind of celebrations of the great venues of rock and roll so I think the first one that we're hoping to do is the roundhouse um, and you know and that brings a completely different tonality to what we do on a Friday night it's going to be much more like an event it's going to be much more present tense hopefully much yeah. more exciting and adrenalized so you want less of those sort of archive based I shows think, then on a Friday yeah show. I think I think that unless it's very singular and you've got a really unique piece of archive that you want to bring I think it'd be interesting to move the form on I mean the other thing which you've done quite recently which has done really well is what I call intelligent list shows, which is, you know, we all know those kind of old Channel 4 kind of, you know, I love the 80s and all the rest of it. We all watch them, and actually they're really compelling because they have, in a boring kind of television phrase, they have multiple points of access, which basically means that if you don't like that track, there'll be one that you might like along in a minute. Um, but that idea of bringing a collection of music together under an overarching theme or an idea uh, and, and that being an intelligent idea, I think, is a very BBC Four thing to do. So we did a recent one on banned records, which is all the records that the BBC has banned, mm. uh, which actually takes you on a really fascinating kind of social history through the, you know, yeah. through the 20th century. So, so you don't mind 
the archive clips as long as it's done in a more sort of intelligent, almost listy well, way? Well, I, I, I just think it's about having a really strong idea behind why we're doing it, rather than just documenting a period. Let's, let's, let's be more interventionist about what it is that we want the programme to be about. And um, uh, I'm going to talk once again about a younger audience. How um, are you going to sort of bring a younger audience to you music-wise? Because mm -hmm. it's great that you're sort of talking about these live performances and mm -hmm. stuff, because mm -hmm. generally on TV, those sorts of things just don't really exist anymore. People don't really do live mm -hmm. music anymore. Mm -hmm. So um, other than sort of teaming up with, with Six Music, mm -hmm. how else will you be doing your own thing to sort of um, to bring those younger audiences to you I think, I think, well, I have to be careful with it because what I do have is I have a very dedicated audience and I don't want to alienate them. Mm. And I think that, you know, and there is, there, there is a truth about BBC Four, which is that whenever we, whenever we feature heavily anything after 1989, we find that the audience falls away a bit. <laughs> Um, and and I, you don't, I don't want to fight that because there is that precinct out there who you know, do absolutely love music of a particular period. But I do think that the way we do it and the way that we broaden out is actually about form. I think that you know, doing the history of music, doing that kind of absolutely classic BBC Four territory, but finding really interesting and more engaged and more energetic ways to do it, I think is a way to broaden out what audience is coming. Now, uh, let's talk about shows that you wish more people uh, had watched. Yep. Um, we're going to uh, tee up, uh, uh, we're going to run a VT of the girl who talked to dolphins mm -hmm. in just a sec, but I just want you to set that up in case um, people hadn't Yeah, absolutely. So this was a film that we showed uh, just earlier, about a couple of months ago. It's an extraordinary, <laughs> it was brought to me by In-House Science, extraordinary story of an experiment that was done in the uh, late 60s, early 70s, where a slightly mad American scientist decided that what he felt he could do was get humans to talk to dolphins. And he set up an experiment where he got a young lady to live in a house which was half flooded with a dolphin. And this is the, this is the little chunk. It's an incredibly sad and moving story, actually. It's also quite rude, but we'll come back to that in a moment. But this is just a, a section from it. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the rude bits, of course, um, that you were talking about is actually Peace the Dolphin fell in love with Margaret. Mm -hmm. And at one point, Margaret had to, let's say, relieve him. Pleasure him. Perhaps. Pleasure him. Yes, indeed. Um, but yeah. No. Um, now, the more the more I've looked into the story mm. of uh, of Margaret and, and Peter mm. and Dr. John Lilly, mm -hmm. the more I wish I'd seen that documentary mm. because it's an absolutely fascinating story. Mm. And you know, and NASA were funding this scientist to do all of this stuff. I mean, it was just absolutely incredible. But I didn't actually know anything about the documentary mm -hmm. until my producer, you know, um, uh, told me about it. And when I read more about it, I was mm -hmm. like, oh my God, that's brilliant. Mm -hmm. And how, so how do you get people to find out that things like this are actually on the channel mm -hmm. and actually sit down and watch it? Well, I mean, I, th I think that's the challenge of any television channel, actually, which is, I think, you know, all of, you know, Kim and Charlotte would say the same thing, which is how do we get more people to see the television that we watch? I mean, the, you know, it got fabulous press pickup as a show. It was a pick of the day in all of the newspapers and all the rest of it. In the end, I don't think it was about publicity and marketing, actually. I think it was an interesting thing about the... Although it is an extraordinary story, I think the audiences find that kind of subject, which is basically, in a way, it's about animal experimentation, really. Mm. I think they just find it quite difficult to watch. I think that people have very strong emotions about animals and what they feel that they should, what they like to see on television. And I just think that although it's it got extraordinary, you know, intellectual kind of, you know, a st amazing story behind it, I just think actually its subject matter is actually for a lot of people actually just a bit too much. So uh, in terms of attracting more people mm. to the channel, yeah. Um, if you had a bottomless pot of cash, mm -hmm. potentially, um, what would you do to get more people to, to, to know what's on it and, mm -hmm. be, and, and gravitate towards it? Well, I mean, I think that, uh, you know, having a Twitter account, a Facebook page might help. Now you just see it in my life. <laughs> um, I think that, you know, in the end, I think that what BBC4 does... Uh, it does really well. Actually, if I had more money, I'd just do more of it, basically. I mean, I think the challenge that I have is that I'm working with a schedule uh, where I don't have enough money to have originations all the time, all across the schedule, you know. So it's a really interesting schedule that we build where we repeat things. Sometimes we actually specifically curate and bring on archive programming. But, you know, I think the amazing thing and the truth about BBC Four is that our originations, the programmes that we make, always do really well. So um, uh, let's talk about the difference uh, when it comes to documentaries like that mm -hmm. compared to BBC Two. Mm -hmm. 
why would that be on BBC Four as opposed to BBC Two? Is it the sort of icky animal side of it? Is that the reason why it might be on BBC Four? I think it's. I think it's. It's. It's not as broad a subject as, as as a BBC Two audience might expect. I mean, you know, the actually interestingly, the commission came around and the um, uh, the, the the story was discovered in the context of actually a series that was being made for BBC Two, which is an amazing series fronted by Chris Packham on animal senses uh, or animal intelligence. Uh, and actually, it's quite interesting. It goes back to what I was saying about complementarity between the two channels, which yeah. is actually there was a very broad. It did really well the Chris Packham series on BBC Two. This is. Exactly that thing that I was describing, which is you do a broad Chris Packham animal intelligence, lots of great present tense mm -hmm. experiments in it. This is BBC Four diving more deeply into the same area. Let's talk um, a little bit about um, uh, Storyville and what it is you're looking for. So mm -hmm. Storyville, you know, someone has described it as the most respected documentary strand in the world, mm -hmm. dot, 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 that no one watches. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I didn't say true. that. I took that as a quote from somewhere mm. else. Um, so is that strand still relevant today? And um, what is it that you're looking for documentary-wise? What do you want people to come to mm -hmm. you with? Yeah. Um, that stand is more than relevant. It's incredibly important. It's incredibly important on a, uh, on a fundamental level that, again, in terms of the overall BBC offer, what we, what we, what we offer on television is I think it's just critical that, the, that we show documentaries from around the world. Uh, you know, a really important part also of what BBC4 is about is about bringing the world to a UK audience. We're very global in how we think about things. Uh, and what BBC4, what Nick Fraser and Kate do with Storyville is phenomenal. I mean, you know, there are an awful lot of documentaries out there getting made. They ceaselessly, particularly Nick, travel the world picking out the very best ones for us. And when you say they don't rate, I disagree with you. Uh, Blackfish, which we showed, rated hugely. And when you were talking about younger audiences, what's really interesting is that those Storyvilles actually skew incredibly young. Yeah. It's actually one of the areas where we really do bring in a younger and more diverse yeah. audience. Um, so Blackfish, we did a like phenomenal Lance film Armstrong on Gaddafi. Well yeah, well. Lance Armstrong did incredibly well. What's amazing with those is that actually they do incredibly well on the channel and they do incredibly well on iPlayer. So, you know, I think that, um, I, th I think with Storyville, you're saying, what am I looking for? I think there are two things, there are two polls that Nick and I kind of talk about that we want to do. One of which is, films that will do really well, that really feel like they're going to attract a big audience, and Gaddafi or Armstrong, that does that. And the other one is just reputational films, films that really feel like they, 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 they do something special and unique, and they deserve to be shown. And, you know, we've got a season coming up, which I kind of love in the 21st century, uh, which has a wonderful film, which is a, a fabulous thing done with the BFI and um, Sheffield Documentary Festival, Kim Longinotto, uh, uh, which is the story of love. Uh, done through archive and it's an amazingly singular piece absolutely beautiful uh, and you know if we didn't do it nobody else would and I think we should and um, talking about let's move on to history and science mm. what do you think you're missing uh, money to do more history okay basically other than other than the money issue, <laughs> other than money, because um, you can't get any more. Absolutely, I mean, yeah, indeed. I think that um, I think with history, because uh, you know, in the current shape of what the channel's money is, is there isn't a specific history slate. But ultimately, the way that I look at what we do with arts and music is as much history as it is arts and music, mm -hmm. because I think that you know, the core of what BBC Four is about is about the history of ideas and the history of culture, and actually, that all becomes mixed up in one big thing. I think that um, I'm always interested in you know, the really singular or refreshing approach to that cultural history, to that history of ideas. So there's, um, you know, fabulous things in the past. There's things I could talk about, but I don't want to preempt announcements. Uh, but, uh, you can, I'm fine okay. with that. Well, actually, one thing that we should talk about is, which actually goes back to the 2-4 thing, is that come the autumn, after the 18th century one we did in the spring, we've got a, we've got a huge Gothic moment coming down the line for both BBC Two and BBC Four, nice. uh, where we've got a really nice piece for BBC Two, which is about the, the amazing night when Frankenstein and Vampire were first written, which is, you know, Mary Shelley, uh, Byron, uh, and various others all going mad on laudanum in a house on Lake Geneva, uh, which is going to be a really rich, really enjoyable, Mark Gatiss is in it, really enjoyable piece for BBC Two. And then what we've got is, a, you know, for BBC Four, fabulous series from Andrew Graham Dixon, which is just the story of Gothic. The title I've got in my head at the moment is Britain's Midnight Moment. But it's not just that, you know, what's really interesting about it is it's not the usual take on Gothic. It's not just Bella Lugosi and kind of slightly camp people dressed up in black. It's about the fact that the Gothic period is incredibly singular and is born out of a very singular moment in time which is a moment of revolution and, and, actually and, I, and I guess for a lot of, for a lot of your, your viewers that you know they 
either were a goth at school or they knew goth as they were growing up yeah. or, or fans of Mary Shelley and things like yeah. that. So, mm -hmm. so already that's, their, that's yeah, that connection. Yeah, I mean, you know, exactly. What it's got is it's got a thing, it, it goes back to that, you know, again, back to the toilet seat. It's got a word at the top of it, which you know, but you know you don't know everything you could know about mm. it. Uh, and of course, we are doing the Tarty Friday Night Show, which is Susie and the Banshees and everything else, so we can just get a bit of that Love in it. as well. I'll totally dress up. <laughs> that would be amazing. Um, when, when we talk about science, though, obviously you have, mm -hmm. there are specific producers who do science programmes, but do you often get science ideas from non-science producers? Not really. I mean, I think that um, I think there are two really important tones for science on BBC Four, one of which is the brain scrambly stuff that I talked about before, which is actually we're just really open to going hugely in-depth into the really quite complicated, gritty bits, the kind of real high science. But the other thing which we do incredibly well and is really unique, again, I think, to the channel, is kind of event science. So that's kind of things like Michael Mosley's guts, which is where he swallowed a camera, and you get to discover the entire intricacy of the human digestive system. Uh, it's Richard Forty on mushrooms and actually exploring all the detail of that. But one again we've got coming up, which we may tie into the gothic moment, is um, a fabulous fit of piece which Windfall are doing for us called Spider House. Uh, no one's ever done a film about spiders. What Windfall have got at the moment is they've got a house which I think is filled with something in the region of 20,000 spiders. Oh, God. Uh, all doing what? their spidery thing. And basically, you're going to go in and see how they mate, where they go, how they sleep, what they do. I mean, as fantastic as that sounds, I don't think I'll be watching it. It might freak come me now, out ever come so slightly. Now. <laughs> um, but let's look, about your let's look at your relationship with um, suppliers. I mean, yeah. how many hours a year do you commission stuff from outside the BBC? Oh, God, I don't know the answer to that. Lots. Basically, um, let's say what percentage would you like to come from? Well, I mean, in the end, uh, it is uh, what in terms of percentage, what between in house and indies, yeah. um, it is as it is set really, as much as anything else. I think, as, as with all the rest of the BBC spend, we have a we have at the moment we have an in house guarantee, which is the money that we spend with the in house departments, and then we have an indie, and then we have a walk. Uh, and, um, whoever comes up with the best ideas gets the walk money. It tends to be indies. Do people, um, do enough people, do you think, pitch directly to you? So I've got an amazing idea, this is it, I think we should be doing it. Uh, I think that, I think enough people do. Um, I'm always open to people just writing to me directly, absolutely. It's always good to keep it quite short, mm -hmm. uh, whatever it is, you know, just give me a top line of what it is that you're thinking about. Um, what I'm really wary of, which is important, is that, that when people write to me is that I don't like ideas to get lost. And, you know, and inevitably the inbox is a bit busy. And so what will probably happen is if I reply to you, I will CC in or bring in the commissioning team because, you know, they have a system and they have e-commissioning and they have all the rest of it. So they're really good at keeping track of ideas. Yeah. So I do want to hear directly from people, but I do also really rely on commissioning as well because uh, they're really important and they also really understand what the DNA of the channel is. Have you got a nightmare slot at the moment that you really need filling yeah. and that one of these guys could come up with a wonderful idea and fill it for you? Oh, there's an interesting thought. Um, clever things to do on a Sunday night. Okay. Sunday night. Clever things to do on a Sunday night. Probably not expensive things, but what could we do? You know, we did something quite interesting, which is we did a very simple thing, which was uh, Heitner interviewing Alan Bennett. And we ran that on a Sunday night, and then we did a week of Alan Bennett films. It did phenomenally well. This kind of thing, you know, one of the things that, you know, pe people can do, there is the origination of programmes, but I'm also really open for clever ideas about how we can put the seed in for something, which actually then we can really unlock and open out the BBC archive because that's another thing which is a really singular part of what yeah. BBC4 is about. And it's a cheaper way of doing it as well. It's cheaper, it's, it's it cost effective. It's sorry, it's cost way. effective. Yeah. Um, okay, now let's talk about this abstract season yeah. that you were going on about earlier. Let's take a look at, uh, it's actually idents that we're gonna show you as opposed yeah. to a trailer for abstract, but here you go. So these are made by artists. Um, now you, you chose this clip because you said um, it was BBC4 almost taking a, a risk. Yeah. Um, why do you think doing that is a risk? Uh, because, uh, well, I was so sick of that library. I'm so sick of that bloody library on the ident. Um, the, the, actually, what I'm doing is, it is quite disruptive. I mean, everybody here is making programmes. Actually, what I do with idents probably doesn't feel terribly relevant to people, but it is a kind of statement of intent, which is that actually changing the channel branding for the BBC is the kind of thing that gives quite a lot of people a hernia. It's the kind of thing that normally takes them three years to do and involves lots and lots of meetings and lots 
lots and lots of presentations. And I just thought, bugger it. Uh, <laughs> what we're going to do is we're just going to make some new ideas and we'll get some artists to do it. And there was a certain amount of wide-eyedness from the marketing and from Red Bee and all the rest of it. But Lord love them, they went with it. Um, and, you know, what I want to do this season, which is just a week of programming about abstract, is that what we can do on BBC4 and what I want to do more often is just be incredibly disruptive and just break up the channel and just do different things with it. And, you know, and again, I'm really open to ideas, not just about a programme, but what can we do for a week? What can we do that feels quite bold and actually changes the whole transmission shape of what we're up to? Oh, Cassian, you are such a rebel. You <sighs> really well, are. Look at you. Well, uh, now, one yeah. of the risky uh, things could arguably mm -hmm. um, be comedy. Yeah. Um, and it's BBC Four has proved, well, as we'll, we'll call it a, a nursery slope uh -huh. um, um, uh, for places like BBC Two because uh, things like The Thick of It and yep. 2012 both started on, on BBC Four. But with the budget cuts, can you still afford to do comedy at that level? Absolutely. Definitely. I mean, Shane and I have talked about it in quite a lot of detail, and we've got some really, we've got some two lovely comedies coming up just for the autumn, which is The Detectorists with Mackenzie Crook and another one called Puppy Love, and those are going to be brilliant. But Shane and I are absolutely focused on what I really want to do is to bring back that edge of satire to BBC Four. And I think, uh, you know, it, 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 that's what it made its name for. It's a really good home for it. And Shane and I are working very hard at how we do that. So you're really I, desperately in need of. Yeah, the well, I'm just shows. really interested. In, in, in satire, in really bold, critical commentary on the world that we live in now. I think that what I don't want is a kind of, you know, a kind of chat show or something like that. What I really like and what I think has been fabulous is, exactly as you described it, the thick of it. Um, W1A obviously ran on um, uh, 2012 is the one I'm thinking of. But those were narrative comedy that had something really sharp and pungent to say about the world we live in. And I think we should have more of that on BBC4. And what you've done really well with on BBC Four uh, is a is a quiz show called Only Connect. Indeed. So well, in fact, yep. BBC Two is nicking that as well. Yep. Um, so, are you in the market for for another quiz show? Uh, well, we've got a few ideas in development at the moment. So, I mean, quiz shows are difficult things to develop, and finding one that's the right tonality for BBC Four is a challenging thing. As I say, we're pretty far down the line with what we think might be a replacement for it. So, I wouldn't encourage people to go off and start working out a, a new one but if you've got an interesting idea i'm always interested in that and to be honest with you you know the the but what the, is it that you're looking for though just to sort well okay so we could look at an only connect replacement which i've got quite an interesting one there or we could look at something quite different in terms of what a quiz show might be uh, and I've got a couple of ideas floating around about that, which I'm quite excited by, which is, does it necessarily need to be a quiz show in the studio? You know, does it necessarily need to be a quiz show that is, you know, a kind of general knowledge thing? You know, though I'm quite open to being quite bold about, you know, in terms of, say, our arts and music, um, does it always have to be a documentary is another way of asking the same question. Okay. Interesting. Mm. I love this rebellious streak of yours, Cassie, and it's well, lovely. Therefore. Um, uh, so uh, let's talk about drama, because I know that I need to uh, give you guys time to ask questions from the floor uh, uh, as well. Mm -hmm. um, now, of course, you don't really have a drama budget, mm. comparative to what the channel used, used to, to have. have yeah. And you said that you're up for a co-production, though. Yeah, well, I think, you know, that, that, that what we have is we have Saturday night. That's really, uh, that, that continues to work well. But we've also done some other things which I think are really interesting. So we had Hinterland, which is a co-production that BBC4 did with BBC Wales and S4C. Did incredibly well. And, you know, we can manage to, you know, I can massage the numbers either with my acquisitions budget or from other contexts. If it's a really interesting idea that somebody needs a little bit of support in or whichever, then I, if, if it works for us, I will try very hard to find a way for it to work for whoever's making it as well. Um, can we talk about money? What kind of money can you offer to someone if they can? No, out? no, we can't talk about money. No. No, no. Really? No. See, you were doing so well with your rebel streak and no. then you went and ruined it. Well, uh, well, yeah, no, but talking about money is very <laughs> grubby for no, a rebel, really, you know. I know. Um, I mean, because obviously you did really well with um, the, the Nordic drama craze because, you know, you, you kicked the whole thing off, yeah, didn't created you? It. Yeah. You know, so you can brush your shoulder with that one. You mm -hmm. did very well It wasn't well me, that. to be fair. But, uh, the, but the channel, channel itself. Did. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And um, you are, uh, you picked an international acquisition in terms of show that you're excited yeah. about. And it's called Cordon, so yeah, let's take is. a look. Yeah, this is coming up in the autumn. 
Gosh, it's a with goodie. those Nordic dramas, everyone seems to be having a bad day. Yeah. And there's a rather nice one that's just coming on at the moment, though, called Crimes of Passion, which is a kind of, it's kind of the midsummer murders of kind of Nordic drama. So oh. it's rather gentle and lovely and quite sunny and has some very oh. beautiful interiors. It's all set in the 1950s. <laughs> Uh, so I had to, it was my wife who decided we'd do it. She said, those rugs are phenomenal. you better put it on air. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to um, put questions to the floor in a couple of minutes. So if you guys can sort of come up with some really cool ones, that would be absolutely fantastic. I'm going to take um, uh, one from the app while you're thinking about that. Um, how does the relationship between you and Kim Schillinglaw work in practice? Are you in charge? Is she in charge? Do you report to her? Do you have to okay things with her? Uh, d d d d basically, um, I mean, Kim and I have known each other for a very long time. Uh, we are friends as much as colleagues. Um, uh, basically, we kind of get together about once a month uh, and we have a lunch and we talk about things, really. Um, and that's where she, there's no sense that she has sign off over uh, particularly what I'm commissioning or anything like that. But what we both work very hard to do is make sure that both of us are cognizant of what the other one's doing okay. so that we can really work together and be quite closely, uh, closely connected. But actually, it's a phenomenally good relationship. Um, uh, and possibly slightly unusual for the BBC, but absolutely, you know, it is profoundly collaborative. Both of us are kind of profoundly supportive of what the other one's doing. It's really nice. It's nice. Oh, sounds cosy. It is, it is. Um, do we have a question from the floor? Or do you just want me to keep... Oh, we've got one right over there. Mm, go on Someone's going to run up and give you a microphone. Um, and, you know, it's often you get in this kind of situation where you can talk direct to someone like Cassian. Or so. just throw things at me. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, Cassian. Thanks for... Uh, what you've said so far. Um, I'm just wondering in terms of your foreign acquisitions, if they're only restricted to kind of crime dramas? Uh, no, oh. that's a good question. No, they're not. Uh, although the audience, in, in a funny kind of way, I think this holds true across the BBC, is that there is a big audience out there for crime drama. Um, but no, I'm looking at another couple of foreign acquisitions. There's an interesting thing around at the moment on the Manhattan Project, which I'm quite curious about whether we might want to take. Uh, I've got another thing which we might put some money into, which again is about the Australians building the bomb. So no, uh, I'm quite agnostic about that. What was the name of the uh, show that you showed the clip from? Cordon. 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 Fine Belgian thriller. Oh, and if, before you give the mic back, if you can say who you are and where you're from. Uh, my name's Nico Franks. I'm from C21 Media. Brilliant. Okay. Thank you. We've got another question down here. There you go. And if you could introduce yourself and say where you're from. I'm not really from anywhere. Peter York. Um, Hello, Peter. BBC4 <laughs> is about consolidating enthusiasms. But how do you determine what those minority enthusiasms are, apart from you and your team, and the people who bring things to you? Because, and I say this in a very caring way, mm. televisionists are not the widest set of human beings there are. <laughs> and you might just be missing something that genuinely is bubbling under and is consolidatable. And I'll tell you the sort of thing I'm thinking on. about. The sort of thing I'm thinking about is the sort of thing that, for instance, Laurie Taylor does, which derive very, very interesting things about the way we live now, which derive from funny old sociological research, mm -hmm. but wouldn't make BBC Two because they don't pose an immediate sort of political question, mm -hmm. or it's at the end of your well, street. It's not quite Benefit Street. If we can just, because you did what the question do you start, do about you? what? How do you find? those sorts of issues and enthusiasms and the populations for them. Uh, I think that it's a, it's a challenge for all people working in television, which is that, you know, that the, the one endeavours to be as Catholic in one's taste as possible, to, uh, to, 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 to engage with as broad a uh, constituency of kind of ideas as you possibly can. Um, I agree with you, it's a struggle. Laurie Taylor sounds like a really interesting idea. And again, I'm very open to, and I do get, you know, the, the, the offers of kind of quite interesting and radical ways that we might approach things. There's kind of rather interesting thing from Philippa Perry that I'm looking at at the moment. So, you know, Grayson Perry's wife, uh, which is, again, a kind of sociology kind of uh, uh, subject as much as anything else. And um, I just think, I think it's something that everybody, and I'm sure that the people here who work in television are all equally cognizant of, is that we all have to be wary of our own blinkers. Do we have uh, one more question before? Oh, gosh, now you all want questions oh now, gosh. don't you? Mm -hmm. uh, I saw this gentleman's hand first, so this one right here in the middle, in the denim shirt, just there. Yeah. Um, 
You see, I asked you at the top if you had questions. You're all being shy and sat there. Do you want to put your hands up? Now you all want to put your hands up. Um, so one more question, if you can say, give your name and where you're from. My name's uh, Mark Thomas. I'm from Creative Scotland. Just This is more of a uh, bit of information rather than a, a question. I sure. uh, was interested in what you'd said earlier about being, other than the work you were doing for with the iDents, working with artists, um, mm. and you were interested in maybe opening up the archive for use of program makers or, or, or artists. So there's actually, <coughs> we've been working with the arts department in Pacific Key, based in, in Glasgow, on an artist's archive in te um, uh, project that six Scottish moving image artists have created yeah. short films. If, it, if it's not a question, darling, you're like going to have to talk to Cassie and ask Well, the question see, is, you, you ruined are it. You I gave you as my last no, question. You, you've interrupted me when I. Mm -hmm. All right, go on, carry <laughs> on. I just wanted to make the point that, that what you're interested in doing is actually happening. Absolutely. I mean, I think that, you know, and, and, and that working with, you know, Scottish Irish communities, I mean, the other thing which we showed recently, which I thought phenomenal, and I think you were involved in, was from Scotland with Love, right, yeah. uh, which is absolutely, you know, wonderful kind of use of archive as a piece of biography. I, I'm always open to that, and I think I have heard mention of it as well so on my radar okay well i'm gonna to have to wrap up there no, I'm afraid. i not. know you were having such fun I was. um but hugely thank you so much thank Cassian. you um it's been lots of fun thank you also to broadcast for sponsoring the session and thank you to you guys for coming along it's been fun thank you